Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the story of choices, the presentation about the quest system behind uh, the choices and consequences in Dying Light 2. My name is Ilyas Mikolennik, and I'm a game programmer in Techland for the last uh, uh, six years. I've been working on mainly the story system, um, developing our engine, which was used to build Dying Light 2, and as well as uh, other unannounced title. Uh, so, uh, I'll be telling about some cool features today. Uh, not all of them are a result of my own work, uh, we did it as a team. So, uh, this is the agenda for today's talk. Uh, uh, I'll tell you quickly about the game, for those of you who didn't play it. And then we'll see where we started and uh, what we had to deal with, uh, what uh, were the requirements and stuff. Uh, and uh, also we will consider all the subsystems uh, on its own. And if you happen to have any questions, please, please leave them to the end of the presentation. So, Dying Light 2. <laughs> Uh, still can't believe it's released. Uh, I'm so excited about it. Uh, how many of you have played it? Raise your hand. Whoa! <laughs> oh man, that's a lot. Uh, I didn't expect that. I, I prepared the slides to tell you about the game, but you already know it all a bit. So, for those couple of guys who haven't played it, <laughs> this is the game about um, uh, the about city Villador, uh, the last uh, bastion of human civilization, which fell victim to a virus. And you play as a lone survivor and you use parkour to move around, to jump on the roofs, uh, and that gives you the edge over uh, the other inf the infected or the other survivors. And um, you also do melee combat and stuff, and this game is packed with action. But this time, uh, as, that was also in Dying Light 1, right? But this time we also wanted to give uh, special attention to the story. Uh, it had to feel immersive. Uh, we wanted the player to feel um, him, himself being, being a part of the world, making uh, difficult choices, deciding who lives, who dies, uh, to form alliances, make new friends, enemies, and so on. And that, all of that should have affected the quests, the world around the player, the game ending, and so on. And all of that had set a goal for us uh, that set the requirements for the system to drive all these things. Uh, first of all, of course, that, uh, the quest, they had to be non-linear. Uh, the player should be able to make choices and feel consequences of them. And uh, all of that, <laughs> we predicted the whole thing to be quite complicated, so we had to use a special editor and better, it would better have debugging capabilities. So you can attach to the game and see how it works inside of the engine. And I'll see you how it's done. Uh, recorded some videos for you. And then we also wanted to quickly iterate on the quest, see what's working, what doesn't. And uh, also, just as every game, it had to be tested vastly. And we, when you have so many choices, when uh, the story develops in such an unpredictable manner, uh, those choices stack up on top of each other. So we wanted to test uh, every bit of them at least to try to test the most of it, right? <laughs> Up to our limit. Uh, as well as Dying Light 1, it had to support uh, four players, seamless co-op. Uh, I'll explain the word seamless later on. And of course, all of that in the open world. Right. <laughs> so, let's see where we started, what uh, writing quests used to look like in Dying Light 1. Uh, as you can see, it's all pure text, it's mostly linear, and of course you can make a great game using just this, but 
our ambitions had set a goal for a better tool. So we had to start from the scratch and write something, something good. Meet the story editor. Yeah, I know it may look unreal to some of you. <laughs> uh, actually, it consists of uh, more editors inside, but for now we will focus on the central widget, uh, which contains the quest graph. And I say quest graph because what you see are actually the quests connected to each other. So uh, this whole thing executes left to right. <laughs> and uh, you can see what goes after what, uh, which is connected to which, and so on. So let's take a closer look. Uh, this is uh, one of those nodes you have seen before. Uh, the quest uh, about water tower. Uh, yeah, uh, one thing I forgot to tell. Uh, I really tried to keep this presentation uh, to make there as little spoilers as there can be, but it turns out it's very difficult when you are working on the presentation about the story. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, sorry for that. There will be a quest about water tower, but you already know that. And uh, those Nodes, they are actually like um, boxes for smaller versions of that graph, uh, which consists of the basic building blocks, uh, those nodes of different type. Those are the atoms, which is the story which it is built from. So let's take a closer look at those uh, basic building blocks. We have more than 200 types of them. So <laughs> let's check out the most common ones. Uh, for example, the show. It just shows an object and activates its functions. And in PC, it starts to do things. And um, a road block and modifies the navigation mesh. A weapon shows a trigger so it can be picked up by the player. Right? It's quite simple. Uh, height does exactly the opposite of show. The object just disappears. And set variable, uh, well, it sets a variable to a certain value. Please note it's not the variables that you write in C code, it's something that level designers create. However, uh, those from C they can actually be exposed, so the rest of the story graph uses them, reads and sets values to them. So those were. Th the nodes that change something in the game world. And there is a second category of them, those who wait for a certain condition to fulfill. And that would be, for example, go to, it sits there and waits, uh, it checks the player movement and waits until the player makes it to the certain areas, uh, take item, waits for an item to be picked up. Wait variable waits for a variable to change its value, but that's quite obvious. And as we had some branching, we also had to use some logic gates to gather all of that execution back in place. Uh, any, you can think of it as a logical OR that requires at least one input to complete in order to continue, and ALL that requires all inputs to complete. Logical end, right? Now, as you're familiar with the uh, quest nodes, let's see an example quest. Uh, this, uh, it's not there in the game, it's something I made up for this presentation. And I record it as I play it, and there on the bottom you see the nodes. Uh, this is uh, the quest editor attached uh, to the game through the debugger, so you can see how it, the nodes change their state as I play. So right now we are on go to. It's marked in yellow, you see on the bottom. So, so it, it waits, waits until, until we, we uh, uh, close, close up, up to, to the military, military convoy, convoy here. here. Now, now we, we jump, jump on, on a truck, truck and, we and we have, have to, to pick, pick up, up an, an item. item. And this item is a teddy bear. Now we got it and we move on. We have to kill a bad, bad guy. guy. Uh, Played, played by, by Hakon for this, for this time. time. 
Uh, as, you as you can, can see, see those, uh, those uh, notes, notes they, are they are colored, colored in, the in the same way, way as, uh, uh, I don't know, know traffic lights. lights. Right. Right. Uh, uh, green, green means, means it passed, uh, uh, yellow, yellow uh, means, means you, you have, have to speed, speed up. up. <laughs> uh, uh, this fight takes, takes longer, longer than, than I expected, expected uh, than, than I wanted, wanted it to be. And the reason behind this is I'm not really good at this game. All right, right we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you just seen a very simple quest, a very simple graph behind it. And uh, the cool thing is uh, the rest of the story is not very different. I mean, uh, there, are, there are more exciting things happening, but it all looks quite simple. It looks similar. And that was one of our goals. Uh, probably the main goal, take a complicated concept and make it look simple. And I believe we succeeded in that for 99%. The rest 1% looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> or this. <laughs> uh, all right. So, we got our uh, quest system running Good for a start. But we don't expect the player to complete the whole game in just one gaming session, right? Uh, so we have to implement another system, a subsystem, which is there uh, in every game made for the last decades, with uh, an exception of the Minesweeper, which is great even without it. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the saves. So, how do we do that? The problem is, even though it is there in every game made ever, there is no universal approach to it. Nobody knows how to do it. <laughs> uh, so, we saw... Um, th that was a huge deal, actually. But in order to see how we approach that, let's take a step back and consider... Uh, Simpler game. Simpler in terms of implementation, not in terms of playing it. Let's play a game of chess. So imagine you and me are playing, and at some point we want to store the position, store the game state. How do we do it? We saw two possible approaches here. One of them is to record the position of every figure at the board. Uh, for a real game, it would also require the movement flag, which is important for making certain moves, and the current player color, and so on. Or there is another approach. We could record the history of moves. Now, when we ca it comes to Dying Light, uh, the first approach is saving every entity on the level and the, its state, and the second approach is what we chose. Meet, this is our movement history, moves history. Uh, it's called call stack, but for this presentation, I will call it uh, call history. And instead of game moves, it contains uh, uh, invocations to the quest graph. It describes how nodes in the quest graph changed their state. As you just start playing, it's practically empty. But as you continue, it contains dozens of thousands of entries in the epilogue. And this is what city in the epilogue looks like. So I mark the invocations to uh, calls to alter world. Those are the nodes in charge of showing vast global changes, like cities collapsing. So, let's take the call history and save it to a file. And when we want to continue with the game, we load the file and apply all those calls in the same order to the graph. Nodes change their state, 
uh, and we forcefully complete them. For example, Alter World, it doesn't even know we load a safe. It just executes, destroys the building to the ground, so we get what we what we used to have before making a safe. And also there are nodes that wait for a condition, for example, take item. Now it gets forcefully complete, Ted, and it picks up the item for us, just as we did it. Uh, some of you probably noticed my obsession with teddy bears. <laughs> uh, it's there in every example, and the reason behind it is that um, it's just a default mesh for quest object in our engine. So we use that to test things, and this is what story testing map looks like. It's just a plantation of teddy bears. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, every one of them does some, tests some functions. You pick one, up one and infected spawn. You pick the other, uh, weather changes, and so on. So let's summarize what we've done. Even though, as I said, the, the problem is as old as the, the world is, the, there are numerous ways to approach the deal, and we got inspired by this thing that we can just save players' actions instead of saving every possible thing. Uh, and uh, that means that the story state defines the world state. It's quite a beautiful conception, in my opinion, and uh, that was the Turning point, that was the most fundamental thing in our uh, engine, and you will see what cool things can be done with it later on. So, let's talk about iterations. Uh, now, as we got our uh, story system, the saves, we have the skeleton now, it's to be filled with content. How do you iterate on the quest? Uh, when it's just one quest, it's not a big deal, right? You just start the game, load a test map, play it and see how it works. But what if your game had 20 hours more uh, gameplay of just the main storyline? <laughs> uh, I'm not even talking about side quests or facilities or stuff. So. How does it look like? You start the game, oh, and you're here in the prologue. And now let's say you want to test a quest which is located here. Look, it is there on the branch. You don't even know if it will show up. It depends on the player's choice. How do you do it? We saw three different possibilities. Let's consider them one by one. The first one, the simplest one, let's make a small test map, implement our quest there, test it, and when it's done, we assemble it with the whole thing. Right? Uh, quite a simple approach. Actually, we did things this way sometimes, but turns out <laughs> uh, Things get complicated when there is branching, when there are multiple quests related to each other. What do you do with this? <laughs> None of these quests make sense on just on itself, right? They're so deeply connected. Uh, and also, as we are in, every one of you works in game dev, you know that there is no such thing as being done, <laughs> being complete. Things change over time up to the last moment, so that was a no-go for us. I mean, sometimes it can be used, yeah? Let's mark it as sometimes you can do it, but we wanted something better. There's another thing. Let's turn on the, say, uh, the cheats, right? Let's hack our way through the infected, uh, teleport where possible, skipping dialogues. Let's speed run the game to the quest we are interested in, make a save, and then use this save as our starting point for the next iterations, right? 
wrong because remember our old body calls, calls history? It turns out it's allergic to sudden changes of the graph. Uh, look, I, I marked there uh, the calls which are related to that uh, part of the quest. If we wanted to change it, and we will be wanting to change it because we are iterating on the quest, we, <laughs> the game is under development. So it wouldn't know how to modify that, um, that area, right? Uh, which calls to add for the new nodes. There is branching. It wouldn't know which way to choose. So this thing kills the whole idea of iterations. Our earlier decision about uh, this using call history limits our capabilities to use saves as the tool for iterations. But what if we don't need to? Uh, let's take a step back and imagine we just finished the pro. Um, the, we are in the prologue. We just started the game. When the initial cutscene is over, you're st standing on top of a cliff with your very first goal to reach another character who is standing slightly above you. And this is what the quest graph looks like. <laughs> You see a bunch of goal tools, the game watches how you move. Let's say we want to make it a few steps ahead to this node. So, how do you do it? It turns out what, everything you need to do is to make go to, to think you already made it. You are already there. So, it passes the execution further. Those nodes come complete instantly, and you make it to the target node, right? So we made just a few steps ahead. But if you can make a couple of steps ahead, we can also make a couple of thousands. The algorithm is as follows. You point the place in the graph where you want the story to be, and then you seek all the way back up to the actively currently active nodes. That will provide us with a path. And then you execute all the nodes along this path in the same manner as if we were loading a save. So they complete, and we get the game state we desired. In order to nicely mark the moments where we will uh, scroll our story more often, we implement point of interest node. We can give it a name, a player's respawn, so it, he appears in the desired location. And later, this is how it looks like in the game debug menu. You just select the quest you want, you select the moment in this quest, and you scroll, <laughs> scroll through it. It's like rewriting a video cassette. And this is the me mechanics, this is the feature we call story invokes. It helps greatly to iterate. It uh, allows to skip the entire parts of the game and making it uh, up to the very end uh, just like that, on, in one frame. But some of you could ask me, Ilya, you already told us so much about branching and stuff. Uh, what happens if there are multiple ways to reach the destination? What does it do with the decisions? Well, to answer that, let's consider a small example I made up. Uh, you can see a bunch of nodes. Which one invoke would take in this, in this case? Um, actually, this one is simple. As there's all, it requires both paths to complete. Invokes would know that, so it would go both ways just as player would have to. But what if we changed all to any? Now it has to decide. It becomes a classic example of a fight or flight choice, right? Now we have to approach the problem in a manual mode. We have to, we declare two choices, fill them with actions telling which way uh, to approach this any from top or from the bottom, 
and then make it to the point of interest. You can think of it as of Google Maps. Look, there are two possible ways to get to this place uh, from Techland Studio located in Rostov. But instead of choosing our way in Chabnitsa, like we would normally do, we mark our destination by um, marking different entrances uh, to Poznan. The reason behind that is that uh, sometimes story executes both ways simultaneously. It's not possible when going by car. So later in the game, it looks like that. If I choose fight, it takes the upper path, goes through the kill node, which will kill the guy for me. If I take the lower path, then it skips go to for me. Very simple. Let's summarize that. Uh, sometimes we can test uh, small isolated quests on small test maps, but um, there is a better way to do that. And call history, uh, it can be, even though it blocks our possibility to, to work with saves in that regard, uh, but we can, it's not a problem because we can do invokes. And this is a very powerful tool. So, I'm gonna tell you a story. Once upon a time, our designers were implementing a quest, Let's Waltz. I believe many of you played it. So, here is how it looks like. Once again, debugger attached, you can see how it, the graph develops. So, there you run away from a very powerful enemy uh, who will kill you if he catches you. It's like a boss fight, but you don't fight, you flee. <laughs> so, uh, what do you do if you, if you failed, if you died? It's not a problem in every other game. You just load a save and try again. Very simple, right? But you don't load the saves in Dying Light 2. And here is why. Remember our uh, requirements? It has to support up to four players, seamless co-op. Seamless means the co-op rules apply even if you play alone. There is no such thing as single player if I have no friends to play with me, it's my problem. <laughs> so, this is what dying in uh, co-op looks like. Uh, once again, I played with myself. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you see the quest graph, it doesn't go back. Uh, no saves get loaded. When somebody is dead, because he fell from a roof, that happens pretty often, we don't make the other three guys to load the safe. It's not fair. We just respawn the poor guy and let him continue with what he was doing. Now you see the problem. That approach wouldn't allow us to make Let's Wild's quest. Because even though we could go to our original position, Waltz wouldn't do so. He would stand there waiting for us and then he would catch us and that would be one of those surprise mo moments. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to go back in time. How do we do it? Once again, there appears our old body whole history. He has got something to offer for us. Let's try to go upwards in it. And as we go, we cancel every call there. So the nodes change their state back to the original. And you remember, nodes have functions assigned to, the, assigned to them. So they change something, they do something in the world. Now let's reverse those functions, let's make them to do the opposite of what they were supposed to do in the first place. So the show beca becomes hide. 
take item will put the item back to place and kill will bring the bear, the guy back to living this way we cancel all the things all the progress and return to the return back in time we didn't want to <laughs> do this for the whole graph so we decided to isolate it and put it in special nodes we called missions uh, those are just like the quest nodes, they contain their all subgraph, which can be rolled back this way. Uh, also, they had to use um, own uh, call histories, so they don't interfere with the main one, and an all own set of quest objects as well. That was quite challenging, not gonna lie, we thought that um, it's okay since it's just one quest, uh, it had to be unique, and then it turned out that there are 350 missions in the game. Whoa. A lot of things to synchronize. All right, we are closing to the end, <laughs> not much time left. Let's see what's left there to do. Right, the co-op. How do we synchronize things in co-op? Let's say you're playing with a friend. Let's say the player B connects to player A. They're playing more or less the same part of the story. They made a different choice here, you see? So we want to synchronize their story. How do we do that? Now we can go back in time, remember? So, we roll back the things that we don't want to be there and invoke forward for the things that we want to be there. And this way, we make the picture look alike. But what's about the quest objects? How do you synchronize entities on the level? Once again, several ways to approach the problem. Leave it to the networking team. <laughs> or use the quest graph state to restore the world state. Once again, the story state defines the state of the world. So, and, and if we are capable of synchronizing the story, we can also synchronize the level the same way. So it's just enough to synchronize the call history. Even there are many of them because of the missions. Uh, but of course, that's not a silver, silver bullet. That um, means you still have to write your serialization um, replication for the rest of the objects which are not connected to the quest. But that's up to networking. So let's summarize what we achieved. The call history is a powerful tool which allows us to implement multiple nice things such as pretty much default saves or invokes or even replicate things along the network. Um, but there is one tricky thing with it. <laughs> Remember, the, it's allergic to changes. It's not a big deal when you're developing the game. But uh, as you release the game, players start to play it. And then you want to release a patch at some point. So you want to change the contents of the story. And the players will load their saves on the different content. So actually, we had to come up with a way to change the past, change the call history depending on the modification being made, made to the quest graph. And that was like one of the most challenging things I have ever touched in my life. <laughs> but we did it nonetheless. And this is it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
uh, one more thing. Uh, I would like to invite you all after this talk or whenever to Techland's booth. Uh, so if you liked what you've seen, if you want to be a part of it or if you want to make uh, new awesome things with us, uh, please come and talk and I will gladly answer your questions uh, and some of the questions I can answer just right now. <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, yeah. One, two, yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, about this saves, because through the half of the presentation, I was having this exact question. So what about when you have to patch the game, and what about this player saves? And you finally went to that point when I was like, oh yeah, he's gonna answer my question, and you didn't. <laughs> so I'm really curious, how did you solve this? How did we implement the patching? Yeah. Being able to alter whatever was, you know, in the call history. Uh, yes, um, well, uh, I would gladly tell you, but the problem is uh, that thing deserves uh, an own talk. Uh, this is uh, such a huge topic that deserves a special presentation. So uh, I kindly ask you to wait for a bit. Uh, perhaps we meet at uh, some other event and I will gl gladly make a presentation about it. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, a quick question about randomness. Uh, did you have some problems with, uh, I don't know, world doing some random stuff that is not handled by the graph and then you have to replicate it from safe or whatever? Like spawning random zombies at random locations and then you have to save it and... Yeah, but it's not story related, right? So, of course, there is some source of randomness, but um, as you said, spawn or something, but that's not exactly the things that are there in the story. It, um, um, it fills the open world content, we can think of it th this way, but the story is uh, pretty much deterministic. There are some special nodes to create, uh, generate random branches, which are synchronized over the networking co-op. Yeah, but um, those are quite specific. Um, the story is very um, predictable, we can think of it that way, as we wanted it to be, since we had to test it. <laughs> Those branches and uh, add randomness and it explodes, you know. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. I'd like to ask you about navigation. How do you navigate in this tool to uh, get into the, you know, for, for example, let's say you have to patch the game uh, with, in some quest. You don't remember this quest anymore because it was developed, let's say, months ago. And you have the big picture. How do you zoom out? Uh, how do you find the quest you have to fix, you know? I had to write finding. <laughs> um. So we can search in this uh, quest graph by uh, different uh, stuff, such as um, uh, quest uh, mm, entity paths, or um, uh, node types, or even specific attributes. We can find everything that contains such a field set to true, or, or something like that. Uh, quite an advanced part, uh, searching that helped us. Also, we did uh, uh, reference finding, so you can uh, could pick any object on the level or anything in the quest graph and see how it's connected to to, to, to the rest of the game, the rest of the story.
Hi, so thank you for the presentation. And uh, one thing that really stood out in my mind was the process of reverting the story graph in the case of, for example, joining a co-op game. And one very important case that came up in my mind was a case of a node you brought up earlier in the talk of set variable. Uh, how do you revert that in a case of uh, for example, if you have to revert a set variable node, uh, do you always keep like a copy of it in the save? Because that seems pretty inefficient, and I assume that you wanted to keep efficiency to a maximum for that co-op. And that's question number one. And question number two, uh, this tool seems very tightly integrated with other tools, with the world editor, considering that the quest graph can affect and directly affects in the case of safes uh, the world state what was the reasoning besides and was there any reasoning besides just uh, file size efficiency for co-op hmm. all right so two questions uh, the first one is um, uh, is about synchronization of uh, quest variables so as we roll back uh, i mean as we approach the set variable node uh, before we actually change the variable we store a copy of uh, the, the previous value inside of that node right so we set the new value move on and when we want to roll back we go we meet this node once again we it already stores the previous value so we apply that it's as simple as that. So we don't store uh, variable values in the save file because the gra graph, the, the very graph already contains all the information we need. And the second one, uh, what were the reasons uh, of uh, implementing that idea that uh, quest state defines the world state besides the quest uh, file size, uh, save file size, right? to get an idea of uh, why, because in general it seems like very tightly with the scene system, like with objects uh, being altered and yeah, generally that, yeah. Uh, all right, so the idea is there is, um, uh, first of all, yeah, it's good for the file size and so on, but also it allows you to implement co-op, as I show. Uh, and it's not as tight as you can think. I mean, the, all its tightment in tights to the level editor are through these uh, entity paths, which are just uh, pure text as you are developing the game. Later we convert it, of course. But as you're developing it, you just use text path, and that's all the connection to the level world. And it's it's not that complicated. I mean, uh, we still use uh, these systems. Uh, we call them separate, and um, that's it. Uh, hey, so as somebody asked. Um, uh, they men you mentioned that the system was tightly integrated with the game, and I wanted to ask how many other tools were um, influenced by this approach. For instance, did you use this kind of like call stack approach with a list of actions in the uh, in the tool that controls the dialogue sequences? Uh, do you mean the debugger? Like, uh, where did we use uh, the debugger? Uh, yeah, because, because it's, it looks very convenient because you can always rewind the, rewind the time and also see uh, how the actions apply in the game in different like paths. Um, so uh, we saw that it mostly was affecting the graph, uh, but does it also affect other tools that you used as uh, yes. part of the editor? Yes. Uh, you uh, in general, you you don't connect uh, to the game just in in the story editor. You connect like the whole thing. The story editor is a part of the bigger picture, the the C engine editor. You connect this 
editor to the game and it automatically tr uh, transfers information for the story, for the dialogues, uh, for some other things. And you, it, can, it is able to show the progress in this quest graph, as you have seen, or in the dialogues, uh, and you can also uh, send events to the game through uh, the, the, engine, uh, the editor interface. And uh, you can do invokes just by clicking quest nodes in the, in the graph. You don't even need a game menu for that. Just click and you got there. So it's vastly used in several subsystems. Sorry, again, maybe I didn't catch it in the presentation, but when you were talking at the beginning when there were like two choices, like two approaches to, to saving the game, the game state, either saving the state or this uh, call history, and what was the biggest gain you saw from choosing this other approach? Because I, I don't remember like you saying exactly like, yeah, we took this because it was, it was giving us, well, Except of this one, like rewind feature, what was the biggest gain you saw when you were choosing between those two? Mm, I believe that would be the principle of uh, mini storing minimum, the absolute minimum of information. Uh, let's say, let's say we pick the other approach, like we store every world's entity and their state and so on. That doesn't help us really to save the state of the graph. So we have to also save it somewhere else. And then it turns out there is duplication of information. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, sometimes uh, too much information can be just as bad as too little of it. Right? So that's kind of philosophical thing, I would say. Um, we, we wanted to keep the information up, down to the absolute minimum. And it also uh, helps with the uh, co-op, for example, right? <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, just uh, so one small question to that: like, do you have any example of like difference between saves, for example? How many you you saved like in space? Did you check it? Uh, in space, you mean uh, kilobytes or megabytes? Yeah, let's right? say like save size. Yeah, because you wanted mm -hmm. to save as less as possible, so just like, you know. Uh, well, I don't know the real numbers, uh, the exact numbers, because uh, save file also contains stuff for uh, other systems, not just story. Uh, so uh, we had uh, somewhere a system written which um, goes over all system and asks them how much the, the biggest possible size that they were allowed to take up on the disk, but I don't remember the exact numbers. Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, hey man, thanks first for the talk. It was very entertaining and very cool also to see some in-engine examples. So Thank you. very nice. Um, and that's what I wanted to get at. As it was quite tools heavy, I was curious, um, right? Tools generally like develop also as the game develops. And I was curious, however, how how was it kicked off between departments? It was like design like went up and like this is our tools document. We need these and that notes, and that's that's what you guys have to do. Or was like design, these are the tools, deal with it, um, or um, um, how did it go? Uh, well, that's just my perspective on it. We got our designers sitting there, and uh, this is a good starter for a talk at Techland's booth, <laughs> by the way. Um, so the question is, if I understood you correctly, the question is, uh, how do we communicate the 
usage of our tools to the designers. What tools right? are required, essentially? Like, how do you guys know, okay, so these are the tools that we need to provide, or was it something actually you just provided ah. some stuff, and mm -hmm. that's what design got, essentially? That, that was um, a result of very close communication between programmers department and design department. Uh, so we came up with ideas, they came up with ideas. Um, the, so we listened to them, <laughs> Uh, trying to provide what what they were needing at that particular moment, right? So, uh, on top of the basic stuff, as I showed you, the uh, graph editor and so on. So, at some point, we decided it's good to make a search, for example. Mm -hmm. so there was a question about it. So, they can quickly navigate. Or they, they always wanted to uh, insert things in the middle of the graph, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, so do it in such a way so it doesn't stuck up uh, and still looks nice or so at some point I had to implement like the special feature which moves the whole thing to the right from the insertion point and stuff like that so it turn it goes um, as a result of iterations so very you, informal actually it wasn't like hey this is the bullet point list and yeah it okay. was informal okay. we just met, met talked uh, and came up with ideas and solutions all right did it create any problems like in in uh, during development mm, no no i <laughs> 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 what <laughs> gotcha <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, no, it was really uh, nice. I, I I prefer to stick to the, the, this um, like f non formal way of uh, dealing with things. All right, cool. Thanks for answering, man. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you developed a very advanced system. I'm wondering, uh, do you have any automated tests or some automatization testing uh, that utilize this solution? Thank you. Yes, yes, we did. Um, that's also a good uh, topic for uh, another talk, but uh, long story short, we uh, had um, a QA engineers who implemented a uh, um, bot uh, who was traversing the quest graph and playing the game, like uh, trying to to portrait a player as the player will, would be playing it, and uh, it um, traversed the graph, teleported, skipped dialogues, and um, tried to play the game actually, and it tested that in that in that way. Um, and of course, unit tests to test the, the functions. Um, that's that's a must, right? <laughs> I don't see any other questions. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure.